So we're back. I'm your host, David Gronoski, and you're listening to Things Hidden, our deep dive anthropology podcast where we look at current events in light of the biblical anthropology found in um, the Christian personhood revolution of Jesus. And, and so one of the things that I continue to run into, but it's okay, it's what we would expect, is that there's a lot of folks who are turning to the faith and 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 great numbers are starting to really in America. That's where I'm focused on. I know there's things going on in different other places, but there's a lot of folks, you know, very online folks that are announcing, you know, that they're converting to uh, traditional, you know, trad religion, right? And it has its various flavors and forms. But one of the things that I noticed from that move is for whatever reason, they're coming with a spirit of kind of defeatism about the big picture, about the big picture stuff, about technology, about healing, about medicine, about institutions, about governance, about the world, about earth, animals, whatever. There's a defeatism that comes along with their way in which they've come to faith in Christ. Right. And, uh, I try to keep a a big picture view here, um, and that means that we got to deal with things in broad strokes and not go after one little denomination or there, or one little uh, tradition here or there, and, and pick on anybody in particular. But there is a general trend that you see online with young men, especially, and a lot of them. You know, it's it's a wonderful thing that people who many of them have been dabbling in atheism or rationalism or new atheism. Some of them come from uh, just blase nihilism and hedonism and drug culture, or some come from something like uh, what we'd say is a, um, like paganism or pagan LARPing, we would say, not really, you know, classical paganism in any real sense, most people. And they find something in the traditional forms of Christianity that they are very, attracted to, that they want to clean up their life. They want to get away from uh, the darkness that they were in, and they want to repent and clean up their life. But the problem is, is that whether you go from the Protestant tradition or the Catholic or the Orthodox tradition, you are still running into this similar theme of being completely fixated on your personal walk, which is extremely important and never to be diminished at all. But it doesn't have to be put as some kind of superior focus in your view of what does it mean to imitate Christ to the detriment of the corporate salvific work of Christ, that Christ came to save the world. He came so that his kingdom would come on earth as it is in heaven. And so you see a disposition because of how corrupt America's government and how morally bankrupt our culture is, is, is trending, how basic categories of identity like male and female, like right and wrong, up and down, you know, merit versus uh, sloth, all these things like for like, what does it mean to be a good worker? What does it mean to achieve? What does it mean to have vision? Everything's being questioned, right? Everything's being undermined. And so it's it's normal in that moment for people to just want to come to a way of approaching faith, which is reactionary in nature. But that's not what Christianity is all about. That's not what Jesus is about. He is not a reactionary at all. Okay? He's not a reactionary. He's not some political progressive, but he's certainly not a reactionary. He doesn't react. He is in the driver's seat of history. He is the master of history. He set in motion the most brilliant takedown of empires and wicked cultural practices ever imaginable in history. And I always say, if you deny his deity, it's even more of a miracle that a mere man alone could have strategized such a brilliant global movement, a, a brilliant global revolution in the beautiful sense of the word, not in the way it's often meant today, where it's a kind of, you know, return to the same old violence origins of our governing structures. 
So I wanted to give a kind of foundational help for this. The Bible begins in a garden. It ends in a city. That means there's work for us to do. When you encounter the realization of the grace of God, this theologically speaking, you have to make that choice of right of understanding uh, that you know this is something that you have to let go of the flesh. You have to die to the ego, die to the self, die to the uh, the d- desire to one up your neighbor, to compete with your neighbor, to to desire what your neighbor has. And this kind of dissolution of that ego self is the is the personal sanctification in theological terms that he, that Christians are called to have. But that's not the point of the Bible. The point of the Bible is much more interested in the collective salvation of the world, in the restoration of all things, in the healing of creation itself, in the healing of meaning, of institutions. It is an attack. The Bible is unleashing a a kingdom of heaven attack on all things related to death, including illness. Illness is a is a battleground of spiritual warfare. And spiritual warfare has many different layers of looking at that. Anthropologically, we can look at that as mimetic disease, people having the wrong desires mimetically caught up in their mind, the wrong thoughts, the wrong assumptions that mimetically what we call placebo effect in medicine manifests in the form of illness that your thoughts can control things like depression, thyroid, all those things. There's so much there that we can unpack. It also has a layer related to, uh, you know, what we would say is something more in the spiritual realm, properly speaking, in which illnesses are a result of that. It's also a, there's a layer of the mimetic when it comes to the political dimension that we have today Diseases, we call them diseases of civilization and our haughty arrogance, but also this kind of self-flagellation there, if you notice that diseases of civilization concept. We're civilized, and yet there's these diseases we've gotten. So it's like a almost like we've we've described it like it's the cost of being so civilized that we have heart disease through the roof, cancers, diabetes, uh, Alzheimer's, all these horrible afflictions, chronic diseases. And these things were not so widespread prior to the invention of industrial seed oil sludge, which became so widespread using polyunsaturated fatty acids, the PUFA that's found in these products, to getting human beings to eat so voluminous amounts of this in their daily dietary intake that it's unnatural to our bodies. Our bodies doesn't know what to do with it. It destroys our thyroid. It destroys our mitochondria, the energy batteries of our cells. It breaks down the human body in so many deleterious ways, contributing greatly, the literature shows, to the structures of uh, the structures of illness that lead to these big diseases become, becoming so widespread the older you get. And unfortunately, trending younger and younger in westernized diets. So that's an example of the mimetic matrix of human power and scapegoating violence, right? Because these these monopoly institutions like Harvard and and the government agencies that they have this incestuous relationship with and political power has created this one-size-fits-all decree-based medicine system that says, this is healthy. You must eat vegetable oils, not the types of fats and oils that humans ate safely for thousands and thousands of years and didn't have the rates of cancer, diabetes, heart disease, and Alzheimer's like we have in our cultures today. That hubristic power of Babel mindset is so pervasive in things like vegetable oils becoming so widespread to replace natural fats, and then that leading to this huge rise in these chronic diseases. So there is a mimetic layer there. There's a mimetic layer of diseases and illness in our personal social context. If people are telling you you're sick all the time, if they're telling you you're not going to get well, your body might believe it. And if you if you believe it, it makes it a lot more likely that your body might believe it and you might manifest the outcome. <clears throat> and that you should read this book called the uh, uh, the the I can't remember the title of it right offhand, but it's uh, about 
how healing works, I think is the title. And it talks about this on that kind of placebo interrelational level of how healing works. When people around you believe you're healing, you're more likely to heal. And when they believe you're, this medicine is not going to work for you, it's more likely to result in an outcome that is, uh, is very, uh, uh, it's going to be inconclusive to what your community around you and what you yourself believe about the, uh, the, the interventions you're taking to have healing. So that's a factor. The political scapegoat mechanism derived monopoly institutions and their capture by psychopaths and industry that don't care about the well-being of their neighbor, that are rebelling against God, right? All of those things are, are wrapped up in the, 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 the rampant diseases and stuff. But I've heard people say things like, well, what's it matter about trying to cure cancer? Yeah, we're going to die from something. That's why we should focus on our personal uh, repentance process. Well, again, totally alien to the biblical view of repentance. Repentance is primarily a collective, corporate thing. It also has the personal part, but taking the personal me and Jesus thing and anchoring that as the primary focus of what the Bible is talking about, what Jesus came to do in history— is completely missing the point. It's completely alien to the reality of what's actually going on in this story that we have. This is about saving the world. And the question is, is Jesus successful in saving the world or not? Most Christians in whatever tribe or uh, denominational tradition that they're in, most Christians tend to believe that Jesus is not going to be successful in saving the world. They believe that say, when Jesus came to save the world, it means he's going to pluck a few souls who are righteous and pious in his way, you know, whatever their tradition tells them that looks like, more workspace, more grace weight, whatever the thing is, you know, he's going he's gonna to have his souls and he'll pick a few from every tribe. And that's what it means to save the world is that he saved a couple from a, a, a you know, like a little, he, he picked two from one country, two from another, you know, I'm using this in simple math, but you know, he's, he's not really going to save the world. Everything's going to go to hell. That's not the biblical view of the Messiah. That's not the biblical view of the Christ, okay? And all you have to know is read the Psalms. If you read the Psalms, you'll start to have an orientation or read anything, really. But but if you want to start with something that's basic, the the prayer book that the church finds its, its, its foundational uh, prayers to, to go back to, that people even outside of the church go to Psalms and so forth to have that prayer orientation of what are we what are we believing, what are we communicating together collectively about God and what's going to happen in history. Then you go to the Psalms. That's the starting point. And you cannot have a, a negative, defeatist, loser's mindset about the project of creation and its renewal if you are reading the Psalms properly and actually looking at what they're saying and being honest about it. Not cherry picking. That's what so many people do. They cherry pick a line or two from a psalm, and they don't read the, all the psalms because it's robustly, apparently obvious that when Jesus says he's going to save the world, he's going to save the world, and that includes the way that the world has art, the way that the world has healing, the way that the world takes care of things like death, the way that the world resolves conflicts, the way that the world relates to one another, the way that the world makes beauty and architecture, all of that is his. And so don't be so narcissistic with your assumption that the whole point of it is just you and you navel gazing about every little particular foible. That's you, you, it's a false kind of, uh, it's a false kind of spiritual dimension that is actually very arrogant because again, it's totally egocentric. Oh, I'm such a sinner. That's all you spend your whole life doing. It's actually a, a false humility. That's actually an ego-centered, individualistic mindset that's creeping into your analysis that's totally alien to the project of Jesus. So absolutely, we are to imitate Christ. Christ does not hide in the house all day saying, the whole world's going to hell. Rome's going to get us. What's the point? What's the point? You know, uh, you know, he doesn't sit around and say, you know, why should I heal this man who's blind? He'll die of something else anyways. 
He just needs to get his heart right. No, that, that's not how he did. That's Gnosticism. Individualistic Gnosticism. It's not Christianity, if that's your view that you are trying to share and spread around the country. It's not Christianity. But by the grace of God, that God is gracious and merciful to people, even in their, you know, coming up with bizarre, you know, the distortions and, and frankly, slanders of what he intends to do, saying that he's not going to save the world, that it doesn't matter that we heal people's eyes, that we don't heal people's hearts, that, oh, that's a side issue. That, that's diminishing flesh. That's diminishing the redemption of matter, which is what we are longing. That's what creation is all groaning for, is the restoration of all of it. Because God is a loving Father, and He loves our eyesight for its own self. Not just that it's a metaphor for our spiritual blindness, that if we have blindness in our eyes, it's only a metaphor for something more important, which is that we're blind to that. Well, guess what? If you think that that's all there is to the healing of blindness in the Bible, then you're blind. You're so blinded by man-made religion that you don't understand that God is a loving Father who truly delights in you being able to see in and of itself that He made the earth not as a metaphor, not as a materialistic trap that is just only a, 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 a little small metaphor of something else. No, it is the seed that is to be planted into a beautiful garden. Everything is a down payment of something that much more better so that our eyesight is only a, a down payment to how much more we will see when everything is fully restored. And when we heal a child's eyesight, with gradual, with, with beautiful breakthrough revelations, not stupid FDA-approved uh, latest scams that mask symptoms or make people filthy rich in the middleman area, but truly breakthrough with these things, then we are performing an act of worship for God. We are imitating Jesus' life in history, in our own way, in our own collective remembrance of what he did. See, this is so important. Some people get so fixated on worshiping their tradition and worshiping their institution and their ecclesiology that they make Jesus a side object that is used as a way of bludgeoning people saying, you're not in my team, you know, because I've got Jesus, because I've got the special boy team. I've got this special little ecclesiology that makes me good, but I'm not good. I'm really bad and filthy and filthy, 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 filthy. And you spend your whole Christian life telling people, don't worry about healing people's eyes. Don't worry about curing cancer. Just worry about your sin. No, that is the sin. To be so holy minded that you're no earthly good is not Christian. Christianity is incarnational. It is the restoration of the flesh, the body, the soul, all of it together. There is no separation. There is no division that you say soul's better. That's Neoplatonism. And if you're getting that in your theology, I don't care what tradition got you there. You better rethink what it's actually about. We're not here to worship Neoplatonism. This is about imitating Christ. Not all of your little special boy statuses that make you feel cozy that you can judge everybody else as filthy and dirty. It's about getting into the mix of it. Risky excellence, not safe mediocrity. This is about saving the world. That's what Christ has tasked us, his body on earth, to manifest in remembrance of what he did when he was in the flesh on earth, healing people, curing diseases, curing this stuff, helping people with their material want, not as some little Gnostic metaphor for something more important, but as both. It is the soul and the body that are important, and they're fully in mind in everything that Jesus does. And he is successful, and he is triumphing through history. And to diminish that, when I point out things like, you know, they used to burn people at the stake, and now we don't do that. Oh, well, yeah, but we do other things like abortion. You are diminishing and you're disrespecting what Christ has done in history. Yes, human sin is very conniving and persistent and elaborate in the ways in which it will justify its little sneak attack returns of violent, sacred, uh, violent versions of the sacred. 
Yes, we talk about that all the time. It is a kind of escalation of grace and mercy, breaking through nonviolence, peace and self-awareness of the human species, breaking through in history, and also a, also a kind of escalatory, you know, opportunity for more elaborate forms of evil. But this idea that it's just a stalemate, don't you ever say that Christianity is pervading and winning in history, you don't know what you're talking about. You don't. And this notion that I see within, again, various traditions that says, oh, the whole point is just to die. No, it's not. Death has been defeated. Christ trampled out death by death. But that doesn't mean you need to go ahead and, and pine for death like that's what you're supposed to do? No. The whole point of trampling out death by death is that so now we have a culture of life and vitality, of abundance, not, oh, now we have to be, you know, picking up skulls and, and fixating on death. Death is an enemy. Death will be cast into oblivion as well at the end of all of this, right, of this whole story of humanity and God and creation. So let's, let's not get all these, these it's Gnosticism, there's a lot of stuff in there that are mixed in, dualism, there's all these different errors that are baked into people's mistakes. And I understand the emotional reason why people go there, because they feel like it's all falling apart, so therefore just hide in your little nook and, and you know, fixate on, you know, the ways in which you can say, um, you know, you, you know, say more holy things to people in your life or whatever, or... or ask for forgiveness about the way you burped or something, you know, like, oh, that was a little bit rude the way I burped there. Like, can I say, forgive me, you know, or whatever. If you, if that's your mindset, okay, you're, you're fixated on egoism in the name of holiness. You're fixated on actual fear of getting out of the boat and walking on water like Christ. And the fact that people are always saying, well, we can't do grand things like anti-gravity or uh, energy too cheap to meter because they'll get, you know, look what they do. They, and they point to these, you know, these kind of suspicious stories of people trying to invent things and being killed or stuff. But it's like, that's a blight on the church. The church has, depending on how you count it, hundred, you know, hundreds of millions, if not billions of people, even if it had 10 million people, that's enough to work with. Even if it's 5 million, that's enough people that could be collectively organized around protecting these folks who are willing to take up their cross and liberate in the name of Jesus by incarnating in the same way he did acts of beauty that says this is God's creation. This is not a joke. If, if there is a repulsive effect that can be harnessed by human beings that doesn't rely on combustion engines or tires and all of that that are all linked up to oligarchic grids that keep us locked into these endless wars and suffering and carnage. This is demonic stuff. And you're telling me that Christians should not be at the forefront of this stuff, of healing this situation? Let my people go. We are not to stay locked up in Egypt. That is not the gospel message, to hide in the closet of your little home in Egypt and just say, my gosh, oh my goodness, let's not stick our head out too much. Let's just focus on being really, really pious and better than all the other people that say they're Christians, especially. You know, we want to, no, you, you, you got Phariseeism, Phariseeism. That's what you got going on. So let's stop with that nonsense. Let's focus on actually taking Jesus seriously, taking God's sovereignty seriously. And when we look at these examples of what Christ does, it is totally interested in both the body and soul, both earth and heaven. It's, it's bringing heaven into, incarnating. It is heavenly to free your fellow human beings from lies to free your fellow human beings from lies of dishonesty and lies about wars, lies about, oh, we need to have these archaic forms of energy. Don't ever try anything different. You'll get, you'll get killed. That's you. You've, the church has totally missed its point. And I don't care if they're hiding something in a secret. That's not what the church is supposed to do. The church is supposed to run to the aid of people who are trying to advance the kingdom of God and incarnate 
the redemption of creation. The redemption of creation means being able to resolve so many of these different issues, like a storm. What, what's the wrong with a storm? You might say, why should you want to walk on water? Because Christ can. Why should you tame a storm? The storm, if you, if you tame this storm, there's going to be a storm tomorrow, so what's the point of trying to tame a storm? Just don't bother about anything material. Just focus on chastising people because they're sinful. That's not what Jesus does. He tames the storm. It's not just a metaphor for some spiritual thing that's all that's important, and the flesh is just kind of this deception. No, that's Gnosticism. Sorry. Wrong religion. Try again. Read, 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 read Jesus. Let Jesus read you. Okay, Psalms. Psalm, let's go to Psalm 2. Why do the nations conspire and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth rise up and the rulers band together against the Lord, against his anointed ones, saying, let us break their chains and throw off their shackles. The one enthroned in heaven laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. He rebukes them in his anger and terrifies them in his wrath, saying, I have installed my king on Zion, my holy mountain. I will proclaim the Lord's decree. He said to me, you are my son. Today I have become your father. Ask me and I will make the nations your inheritance, the ends of the earth your possession. You will break them with a rod of iron. You will dash them to pieces like pottery. Therefore, you kings, be wise. Be warned, your rulers of the earth. You rulers of the earth, serve the Lord with fear and celebrate his rule with trembling. Kiss his son, or he will be angry, and your way will lead to your destruction. For his wrath can flare up in a moment. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. Now I want you to see this. This vision is the question is, is this going to happen or not? Or is this just the Bible being really, really just a little bit too, you know, hyperbolic in its hopes? No, come on, that's disrespectful. This is really going to happen, and it is happening in history if you have eyes to see and ears to hear. I will make the nations your inheritance. That's happening right before our eyes. Every nation on the face of the globe is having to pull more and more and more its playbook under the dominion that is saturated with Christian, more importantly, Jesus Christ ways of being. Even though they're lying, even though they're twisting it, even though they're they're coming up with elaborate ways to, you know, pervert Christian sense making, Christian aesthetic and ethic, that Christ, I mean, when I say Christian, I'm talking about imitating Christ. Don't we're just start start with that. That's the that's the standard that we're 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 judging whether this is happening or not. Jesus does not do, you know, things the way you expect him to do. So when it says I will make the nations your inheritance. The way you guys in the, or the way we guys, let's say it this way, the way we guys in religion t tend to do, we think, well, unless, you know, that's coming out with a sword and make them, you submit to me right now, that's what Jesus is doing. Like, this is the guy that shows up in a food trough. Why would he do that? Why would he do that? What in the world? Where did you get that? This is a guy who's naked, being filleted alive, and he's saying, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. This is not a guy that's saying that because they don't know what they're doing, but soon they will know and I'll get them. <laughs> I didn't say that. That's the God that you make up in your head. That's the God we make up in our head. That's not Jesus. We get in the way of the scandal of the cross by adding our own dumb scandals, which obfuscates the picture. Let's stop that. You will break them with a rod of iron. You will dash them to pieces like pottery. The nations, <laughs> the nation state is dissolving right now. It's been dissolving. It's been a slow to dissolving process. Democracy, our democracy is being exposed to be a ruse for oligarchic fascist control. That's, you're watching in real time from a little ant's perspective, this big picture thing happening, okay? You would dash them to pieces like pottery. What do you think is happening right now? Nation states are being unable to maintain and contain their people. They're being unable to contain their enemy other distinctions in very, very deep and serious ways. Tucker Carlson's going and speaking to Putin, which will be, you know, 
bringing a window for both communities to stop with this frothing hatred that one is supposed to have if you're a member of that nation state collective container. Okay. Nations are clashing with nations. You know, oligarchs are trying to flood America with tons and tons of labor to try to remake the political and cultural environment of this country. But even so, even in their, you know, cynical attempts, these things will be redeemed because these nations are dashing, he's dashing them to pieces like Potter. When you break it, it scatters everywhere. And nations are are mixing, you know, there's this kind of collision. And it's it, what I'm saying is it doesn't mean we are supporting, you know, oligarchs trying to flood a nation. You know, if you got a nation, let's say you got a nation of 5 million people and oligarchs that want to have labor and other things, say, hey, let's just flood in 2 million people, disregard everything they've ever had, disregard their economic debt and all that stuff. Obviously, that's not a good thing. But the point is, is that they're doing things they think they're going to gain from. But in the end, the chess maker, the chess master, the true master of history, Jesus Christ, is using all of their moves. All of their moves are under his saturation. And all their moves are going to be undermined because they're saturated by his revelation. Does that make sense? So I've pointed out with the Israel-Gaza conflict that they have to you know, both sides of that conflict have to try to win the favor by showing that their side is the most aggrieved, right? That's not the way these nations, when this Psalms 2 was written, that's not how nations had to vie for power in the world stage. They didn't go around saying, we, in our local dispute with our rival, have had more of our women and children killed than them, so give us more money or give us more power and support and empathy. That's not how you did it. That is a rule book that has been instituted as a reaction by these failing nations, all of them around the world, to the rule book, the sandbox, so to speak, of Christ being the master of history. He said the least will be first. The, the meek shall inherit the earth. The meek, you can't get any more meek than women and children being killed because of oligarchs above them blowing people up and killing people and torturing people and doing all the things that, that's going on. And yet they are in the process of inheriting the earth because the powers of the world have to pretend, they have to hide with human shields more and more cleverly, more and more elaborate forms of human shield making to present their case to the broader world community that they are the one that should win and have their way of might makes right. They can't do might makes right direct anymore. Now we have to hide it ever more elaborately under victim concern narratives. And those narratives, because they are laced with victim concern and because they are laced with media reporting in real time outside of the gatekeeper media, we're able to poke holes in the propaganda and the us versus them mythology faster and faster in real time. As I've said before, look how long it took the inauguration of the Bolshevik revolution and what the horrible, heinous things that happened to those folks, how many decades they had to suffer, torture, rape, murder, pillage, torture, torture, imprisonment, horrible things, confiscation of land. And decade after decade, how long did it take before the world community started to wake up to the realities of how heinous that ideology was. At first, it was treated by all the world's community like some kind of futuristic ideology of the future that was benevolent and all this, and then they started to wake up slower and slower. The, the type of news and uh, media technologies they had at the time were not as, uh, as, as Christ-haunted as they are today, and therefore it took longer for humanity to respond and to wake up to the lies of the communist mythology and to start to expose it and to allow it to dissolve. But look how much faster with this recent uh, pandemic response, the nonsense, the lies, the tyranny that was trying to be foisted on people in this rapid manner. It was able to be real-time checked by fearless folks 
like McCullough and uh, who I've had on my show, you know, Dr. McCullough and, 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 and Corey, Dr. Corey and all these folks that I've had on my show over the years, I was having them on before any of the other uh, shows really were putting them on a lot. And look what they were able to do real time, check all the lies about what, what they needed to do with schools, what they had to do with separating your grandmother. So she couldn't see anybody in her, in her nursing home, what they did with the lockdowns, what they did with the, the identity cards that you had to go around, all that stuff was getting real time checked faster. It wasn't a 10 year, 20 year delay, 30 year, 40 year delay. Like what used to take to, to dissolve the mythology of Bolshevism. You see what I mean? So things are more rapidly dissolving. The more elaborate the, uh, the nation states have to desperately try to hide and appear to be slain lambs to justify their latest little gimmick of tyranny. And that will continue to accelerate. That's what it means when we're talking about, therefore, you kings, be wise. Be warned, you rulers of earth. Serve the Lord with fear and celebrate his rule with trembling. Fear God. If you fear God, you don't have fiat currency. If you fear God, you don't have these rigged regulations. If you fear God, you don't have these wars based on lies. If you fear God, you don't poison your population with toxic seed oil sludge. If you fear God, you don't push FDA-approved drugs that are just dropping nukes on our bodies, so to speak, to solve a disease like uh, met metastatic cancer, rather than things like uh, an antibiotic, which is non-intrusive, that Dr. Lasanti folks like that have been exploring with 39,000 citations to his name and, and, and scholarship journals. And I elevate his voice because I understand that this is a part of what, what we are supposed to be doing. Thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. In heaven, there is no cancer. And that is coming into history through the body of Christ in remembrance of what he did as a down payment of what we would do. He said you would do greater things than he, and that is an offense to Gnostic individualistic narcissism, Christianism, Christianityism, or whatever. That's an offense to them because that makes them put them in the hot seat again. You can't hide out and be a little Pharisee, you know, oh my goodness, I'm just so... And it's not a perfect analogy to Pharisee, but it's still the same basic spirit. Serve the Lord with fear and celebrate his rule with trembling. Kiss his son, or he will be angry, and your way will lead to your destruction. For his wrath can flare up in a moment. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. I want you to understand this on an anthropological state, uh, framework. As the state continues to lose its power and its oligarchic corporate media outlets lose their grip on the human mind, as older forms of archaic control and Industry, industrial food and industrial energy and all these different things start to be rattled and, sh and, sh and shake and shook, right? What happens is this can quickly, if you're not following Christ, if you're not imitating the way of Christ, which says to resolve your matters through peaceful, nonviolent solutions, cooperation, mutual aid, if you're not finding creative ways to resolve these impasses without Resort, resorting to, I must vanquish all my enemies and arrest them all and all this stuff. If you're not working on those, then this will lead to your destruction. For his wrath can flare up in a moment. This is what happens when mimetic desire is unleashed from the, the original catacomb, the container that was the scapegoat mechanism. The scapegoat mechanism was controlled acts of violence to resolve out-of-control violence that can flare up in a moment. That's what this is dealing with. The wrath of the sun, in other words, is the turning away from the call of peace that, that, that Jesus' person in his inauguration, the way he acts that we're supposed to emulate in history. When we resist that and say, no, I'm going to grab my sword and get my enemy, or I'm going to, you know, still... Uh, mimetically desire their way of looking for power and their way of holiness and their way of whatever. When you're still going for holding on to these dying nation structures and the ego structures that all kind of symmetrically go together with this, this is going to result in more and more flare-ups in a moment. In moments, boom, 
you have mob things. Look at what happened with the the uh, burning of the cities at the Black Lives Matter riots. Look at what the January 6th riot. Look, these things can flare up in a moment and they can spill out of control way a thousand times worse than those versions. So blessed are those who take refuge in him. Blessed are those who put their trust, in other words, in imitating the way of Christ all the way through their life, their society, their nation, and allowing that to animate the way they look at things, that Christ is winning. winning. This When this story was written, when this psalm was written, it, it was just glimpsing into the future. What we are getting to see, if we look back at history and look now, we see it happening even faster. Why do the nations conspire and the people's plot in vain? The kings of the earth rise up and the rulers band together against the Lord and against his anointed one. Let us break their chains and throw off their shackles. The one enthroned in heaven laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. I have installed my king on Zion, my holy mountain. The holy mountain starts with the stone, the stone the builders rejected. This is what we see in Daniel, that the stone grows into this mountain, the prophecy. And this mountain is taking over the world because the knowledge of the Lord continues to fill the earth as the ocean is wet, Habakkuk chapter 2. And what does that let us know? That more and more people are waking up to the futility of trying to use collective violence, dehumanization, otherization, to resolve their problems because it's not working. And that we're going to have to find another way because once we're aware of our humanity and we're self-aware of what the human species does and why it's still doing similar patterns today, it allows us to move into a creative space to resolve our differences. That's what peacemaking is all about. That's what Jesus came to do. He said, blessed are the peacemakers. Not blessed are people who are too holy to try to make peace. Blessed are the peacemakers who get into the action and not say, well, you're all just out of it. You don't get it. That's why, even though I have my views, I'm willing to mix it up with leftists and Democrats and, 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 and find ways to talk to them. I'm willing to talk to folks who are all into the Trump thing and, and, and find common ground where we agree. I'm not playing this little I'm on the you know mountaintop and everybody else. That's what the tendency is for people once they feel like they get a glimpse of truth, especially the nuclear power of the gospel truth. They want to go and wave it around. Oh, I've got this magic thing, and I'm going to you know, look down on you. You guys don't want to get it. No, that's not, again, that's more Gnostic stupidity. We're not here to worship Plato. He's, he's dead. We're here to follow the king of history, the master of history, Jesus. I hope that helps. Psalm 2, check it out yourself. Give me your thoughts. Let me know what you think. Email me, hello at a neighborschoice.com to do so. 